Hello, welcome to the bee vlog. So I just finished up a day and a half of fun at a treatment-free beekeeping conference here at Pacific University in beautiful Forest Grove, Oregon. There are lots of beekeepers here from all over the states. Uh, even a couple from all the way from New Zealand. That was pretty impressive. Uh, it was a good attendance, good times. Just uh, talking bees all weekend. Didn't think uh, you could really say that much about bees, but it turns out you can. Um, Got to have a good time listening to lectures and also getting out into the hives. Um, we got to learn about marking queens and I got to try my hand at grafting queens. Got to listen to some good music and had some fun. I think the number one thing I learned from this was that no matter how experienced you are and no matter how many years you've been doing this, there's always more to learn because all of the experienced and expert beekeepers here we're talking about all the things that they're still trying and still testing out. So to all the new beekeepers, I would say there's never any one right way to do anything and to keep testing, keep trying things out. Beekeeping is very unique to your individual areas and you know, you gotta try it your way and do what works for you. Anyway, it was a lot of fun, good experience. Enjoy some video. So what we can see is that this, this swarm was set up, this was an artificial swarm made by shaking, like basically making a package. The queen is in a cage, queen cage here, and that's why they're clustered on this board here. And they were set up this morning, they were shaken out of the package cage onto this, and the queen, they shaken down here, they found the queen clustered up here. And you can see there have been scout bees out searching. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're not near an agreement, because this, here we've got a scout that's dancing straight downward. Here's a bee that's dancing kind of to the left. Here's one dancing straight up. They found a, a number of different options. So let's, let's practice a little bit on interpreting these dances. The queen is at those, then things really just collapse and you know, uh, quickly build up at that site. I guess everybody's attracted to her, her As far as flipping the queen wing, so she can't swarm, they'll, they'll, if they want to swarm, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, wait for a virgin? Yeah, I think here's often. In my limited experience, because I don't clip my queens, but I, I have seen what happens sometimes when that happens. Is the, Swarm goes out, workers go out, queen goes out, she crashes, she doesn't always find her way back in the hive, and um, I guess sometimes she gets lost, you know, crawling through the grass around the hive, and then everybody goes back in, and yeah, and then they go again once one of the young queens is emerged. Snickering at my <laughs> amateur bee knowledge. <laughs> it's, it's a logical result of making a record all about bees. You're just going to end up right here. <laughs> so that was all the lives, uh, uh, you know, the jobs of a worker bee. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I read that they do, their jobs are in order from least risky to most risky, which makes a logical sense in the life of a bee that like, lives 30 days. And again, I hesitate to tell you anything. <laughs> uh, purely academic knowledge on my part. But pretty cool stuff. This is more getting stung by a bee based. <laughs> Shape our 
cactuses and the sun is With our mating nukes, we use standard standard setups such that then we can just pull the divider and it's a single. So I use big frames, but he's right. The hardest part or the, the, the part where it really chokes on time is catching queens. 
the bigger the frames, the bigger the split that you have to find to clean, the more time you're going to spend finding them. But I like mine to be big. The reason I like mine to be big and in standard equipment is that then I can basically, um, like I said, pull the divider and it's already a whole other single that I can just add boxes to. Additionally, when I put my graft in or put my, my queen cell in, I give them minimum three weeks from virginal emergence before we even ever go in to bother them. And the reason we do that is the first week she's going to make, granted it's not going to take her a whole week to go and do that, but just in case you have inclement weather or what have you, you give them at least one week. Second week, she's starting to lay eggs. Okay. Third week, those eggs that she laid the week before are now starting to be capped. So that when you go in at the end of the third week, you see not only eggs, you see her, you see eggs, you see developing larvae, and you see capped brood. So which basically verifies to you like she made it successfully and she's laying fertilized eggs. You can visibly tell that it's worker brood and not drug brood. And then that's the mm. only time that I will either harvest her, you know, to then put in a cage and, and send her to somebody. Um, and then I know that I've sent them a very ripe and well-mated queen. If she doesn't make it on that end, then perhaps it was shipping issues or something like that. But at least I know it's not that she didn't mate well, you know, that sort of thing. So, and my favorite time to rear, at least for our area, is right now. Because we have such volatile spring weather. I mean, literally, when Kirk came to visit, I showed that photo. Pam and Mark went down to the valley, they checked bees, they put out a few palm patties, and then, um, they came up to the home and the next and we had a conference the next morning and I was putting it on and the next morning we woke up and it was a four inch blizzard and I was like oh, I twenty five got shut down. We still had seventy five people show up. I was like I was like, no one's gonna come. <laughs> the weather's bad. When you send a queen out that late in the summer, do they have enough time to are they, are they for people that are requeening or you know, do they have enough time before winter to to get them in? Well, so basically our, our production will start I'll do my first graft around April tenth. Uh, that's my target date. This year, spring was three weeks late, so I didn't do my first graft until April 30th, which is the latest I've ever done it. So, like I mentioned, we wait till we see drones actually emerging, then I know, all right, now I can do my graft, because in two weeks' time when those queens are ready, now those drones will be mature. So then, once I do my graft, then I know basically, and we'll talk about the, I'm going to go into the timing here right now. Um, everybody's an egg for the first three days, right? Then they hatch. It's the only time they actually hatch. I always say hatch when they emerge, but they actually hatch. Then they get, they're getting fed royal jelly for the first three days while they're in that larval state, regardless of the gender. Um, after that third day, that's when it switches to bee brood for workers and for drones. Okay, so you want to time your graft between day three and basically day five. Does that make sense to people? Mm -hmm. That's because that's when they're just being fed royal jelly. If you graft something bigger, sometimes the, the bees will be like, "Oh wait, that's too old," and they won't even they won't even take care of it. But sometimes they will still continue to feed it, and you'll have what's called an intercast queen. It's not really a true queen. So it's really kind of essential if you're going to do this process where you're where you're manually taking your larvas out then you want to do it in that time. You can also do, like Michael Bush talked about, to walk away splitting where you, you know, just take young brood, sealed brood, well, everybody has their own version of it. Um, but I always say take, take a lot of sealed brood when you do a split because those bees are going to emerge out and they're going to know no other home, so they're going to stay put. I also recommend that if, for you to move that split because you want to mimic nature, right? And a splitting is basically swarming them. Mm -hmm. A swarm would leave. So you really want to actually take them away. I think textbooks say at least five miles, but I've gotten away with a minimum of about you know, three. I don't go, ever go under three at the closest. What are you looking for when you're doing this? I'm now going to look for the right age. Um, and I'm just trying to see if these, I'm hoping they didn't get too big on me. Oh, no, oh, awesome. OK, we've got a good patch. Um, I'm going to graft one that is the right age, and then I'm going to graft one that's just a little bit too big very hard to tell the difference, but I mean, you'll be like, wow, that's too big, that's still so small. But there, there really is, it's a critical window when you want to do it. So lucky for me, I actually did a presentation to Marin Beekeepers like 2010, I think. And, um, and they asked me like, so how do you grab? I'm like, well, you just stick it in and you do it. And they're like, okay. And so it was awesome because I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do it. And then you guys tell me what I'm doing. So they watched me. It was like slow motion and they broke it down for me. So now I'm like, okay, that's how I describe how to do it. Cause I'm like, well, you just stick it in there, you know? 
But so this is how I do I This is kind of the tool that I learned on, although the ones that I use are bamboo and cartilage. This is cartilage. I've been told it's fish cartilage. Um, hoping it's not human. Um, but at any rate, I usually, uh, what I end up doing is I go in, I have it upside down. You guys, can you guys see that? So the cartilage is on top. Um, and I basically, and I'm just going to show on some random cell. I, if you guys notice, I put my comb upside down. I personally like to graft with the bar down here. You may like it the other way. I found that when I have it right side up and I try to graft because of the angle, right, that I end up mashing more comb and damaging the comb than if I come in from this angle. But really, I mean, you you figure out what, what method's going to work for you or that you're comfortable with. Um, what I end up doing is I usually go in, I, I start at the back wall of the cell. I can feel it going down. So once I once it hits the bottom, you notice my hand's not on the plunger at all. Okay, it's just on the actual um, rod. I go down the back. As soon as I feel I hit bottom, I twist up and then I pull out. And the larva will be on the end. That won't put anything in it. And it's then not until like it's I'll so show. Small. No, I'll show you guys actually <laughs> this. But I wanted to just show you that that it's a half technique. twist. You a half twist exactly. Well, I guess that's is that 180. Mm -hmm. Go like this, yeah. and then and then pull like that. Um, um, once they're on here, then I will actually make sure that you're in the dead center of the cell. Once I feel it's on the bottom, basically I'm pressing, so now it's like this. You guys see mm -hmm. that's an L shape. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once I know it's like that, then you press the plunger, and it just pushes the jelly off. The, the larva is actually on a little bed of jelly. They're floating on it. And the reason I like this tool is because then you never touch that larva. Mm -hmm. You just never even touch it. You're basically just transferring royal jelly is what you're doing. I also, um, well, first of all, we're a two-person out with small kids, so I would love to say I make my own cups, but I just don't have time. Um, I like the Jay-Z BZ cups because you can actually see through them. So once they develop, you know, back in the day we called it candling, you know, they'd hold a light behind it, you could see other pupas in there. But you can just look down in here because it's clear enough, and oh, yep, someone's in there. Plus then you can push it into your comb and you never touch the actual wax. You're just touching the base. So I, I've come to find that I like this. Um, I actually, I did bring, I'll pass these around. Here are a few little wax cups. These I got from Better Bee. Not actually sure where they got their wax from. Um, so I, I can't necessarily say that that's the best place to get them. But um, I, use, I use wax cups when I'm doing royal jelly. Production and for us, like I mean, I I can't compete with the Chinese. I can't go in every 15 minutes, you know, and, and suck out the jelly. So what I do is I'll graft off of um, off of a non-breeder, and I will um, I'll we'll put in a cell builder after day five. God, these tools are so new. It's like I <laughs> they gotta be broken. The the really. <laughs> so that's the right age. And if you guys want, you can take this light to kind of shine. We use a three-quarter size, which is actually, it's two inches shorter than a deep and one inch um, yeah, it's pretty taller than a medium. So it's, it's actually different than a medium. But, um, but we basically, Mark just takes end bars. This is actually an end bar from, from a regular frame. And he just, and then we, we flip it over and then we can stick our cups in it. So he just use, and he makes pretty much all of our equipment. Um, we will do, if I've got really tall cell builders, um, meaning like three boxes or more, or even two boxes or more, I, c I don't ever like to ask any one single cell builder to pull more than 45 cells at any one time. So we can put another bar here, and usually it's 15 cups per bar. If I don't need that many grass, then you know I'll just put two bars in there. Um, and then depending on how many we need will be, how many cell builders we use. We prefer to use queen right cell builders because we're doing weekly uh, grafts and we used to do twice a week, which if you're going to graft twice into the same hive, you want to time your second graft to be after the first graft is capped. You do your graft on, say, day, on day three, five days later, which is now day eight, they're capping it. So basically, you know, after the eighth day from when it was laid as an egg, you can put another graft in there, and then those grafts will not compete for jelly like these grafts. The reason I pointed to this page in the manual is because this is the setup for our nursery chamber. Whether you're using eight frames or ten frames or even you know just five frame nuke um, or ware or top bar, whatever you end up using, 
there's a particular setup that we recommend for mm -hmm. the, for good success with rearing your queens. It takes a lot of royal jelly, to, or yeah, it takes a lot of royal jelly, but it takes a lot of pollen to make the royal jelly. So right next to your graft, you're going to want to put a big fat frame of pollen, especially if you're asking for a lot. Okay. Um, on the other side, I like to put open brood and younger open brood. I don't like to put a frame of eggs. They're going to compete for royal jelly. But I want open, younger brood so that it pulls those nurse bees up and they're right there feeding those and mm -hmm. feeding those queens. You need a lot of nurse bees to make that royal jelly. Okay. So how do you keep a queen right cell builder from destroying the cells? Well, like a manual okay. shape. But, and I think that's on page, I have a little diagram. We, when we use our clean rights, we use um, double excluders. Okay. So basically, we put our queen, here it is right here on page nine. We put our queens in um, down below in the bottom of brood chambers. Uh, she'll get at least two boxes of brood chamber, put one excluder. Then we put super. Then, and as, as they need room, we'll even put another super. Um, the more full the super is, the better it is because all those full combs block her scent from your nursery chamber up top. Whatever amount of supers we have right here, then we'll end up putting another excluder on top. You don't have to double exclude it, but for us it's peace of mind. It's like, well, just in case she gets up there, hopefully she can't get through the second one, right? Um, and then on the very top is where we put our nursery chamber. If you're not going to do a multi, you know, or a big hive sort of system, you could just, you know, pull aside a nuke do a few cups and push them in there, and they'll still pull out those queens, and you can kind of, you know, then later cut them out and move them as you need or take that whole frame and put it in another split, and off they go. Um, and we'll talk about the timing for that. So it takes 15 days for them to rear a queen. I know this is a lot of information. I'm sorry, and it's after lunch, but I hear you just want to share this stuff. They would start those cells in a queen right colony with just queen excluders in? Mm -hmm. Well, basically, you, you need to buffer her scent. Some people use cloak boards, Sometimes, like especially at the beginning of the season, we're setting it up. Um, you know, it's kind of like everybody's back in training. It's like, oh yeah, it's like riding a bike. And so the bees figure out what you want them to do. So usually the first take is not that good. But one of the methods I use, I don't actually use cloak boards, but I'll put a sheet of newspaper right underneath the nursery chamber in between where, you know, the supers and then my queens down there. Especially in the spring, they're not that big, but they're big. Um, and I'll put a newspaper there and then that way I don't have to go back right away. They'll just chew through it. But it's enough to block that scent for 24 hours and that means then they will pull those cells out. They'll pull them out as well if a queen doesn't get to them. So you could try and do it without an excluder, but eventually she's going to smell their pheromone and she'll come up and find them and she'll chew them down. Timing then, when I do the graft on day three, and for Mark and I we actually just, as you know, Three to five days is when you want to do that graft. So we decided to compromise and we just call it day four. Whenever I do the graft, that's just day four. And we do that just so that we can, you know, we don't ever go back to the hive and it's like, oh man, they already hatched out. I guess my math is wrong, right? So we call it day four. And literally we know that a week later, so that's seven days later, now that's day 11, we can get a final count of how many cells will go back in and look and see how many cells we have. And then the next two days we start making nukes. Because we know, oh, I got 45 cells, okay, we gotta make 45 nukes. Or I gotta go catch 45 queens to, to give them a home for it. And then I actually like to pull them on day 13 and go immediately and put them in wherever they're gonna be. Before so that they then hatch. they can emerge, yeah. yeah. We do hatch out some of our cells, when I, because we used to ship cells, but where we live, UPS and FedEx are just horrible. So, um, mm. you know, I had I had several people like, oh, I got them, but they're, they're popping right now. And it's like, <laughs> oh. So, and you can't really ship them earlier because the last thing to form is the wings. So if you oh. ship them and they get really rattled, what good's a queen that can't fly? She can't mate, she can't do anything. So. We decided, to kind of, we decided to kind of start hatching some of them out when people have um, requests for that. So I sell virgins now at this point. Plus then I sell them with attendants and I know that I'm sending them, you know, they don't have to go, well, did, is there anything in here? Is, did it make it? It's like, no, here's your queen and now you put her in. They work the same as mated queens. You install them and then pretty much, uh, the only difference is that once they, and I only put a half tube of candy in the virgin one so that she can be released quicker. But basically, once you install her, then you know, okay, I'm not going to touch you for three weeks. Mm -hmm. 
That's the only difference. Whereas with a mated queen, it's like, well, maybe I'll go in in a week and see how she's doing, right? You just have to wait at least three weeks. And I recommend even four. It's hard, especially too, because if some of them don't take your all damn, I wish I knew that ahead of time because then I would have fused them. But literally and honestly, if you go in before, they're still, their pheromones are still just getting developed and they could blame her for the interruption. There's been times where we check them, she's there, and then I go to another house and I'm like, oh, I think I wanted to mark that one. And I go back and they've got her balled up. And that was because I went in there too soon. So we, we've learned to just, just give them at least 21 days after you do, um, after you install them. Yes. When you introduce in queen cell, you do not make that uh, new colony queenless for 24 hours? Um, and remove the queen and the, the queen cell right away? No, because if I go out and catch queens and I take my cells with me, my cells are 13 days old, I'll catch the queen cager, I'll go to put the, this queen cell in, she's not going to merge for two days. So yeah. they're still queenless for two days. Oh, I see. Okay. But they can start to smell that they've got, they can smell her already in here. And so it's not like, they're not stressing out like, oh, i got to pull out a queen. You know, they don't start pulling out emergency queen cells. But they just, they've got a two, two day break before this mm. new queen emerges and that's enough to, to give the, them that sense that they were. Removing that queen and introduction of the queen cell, you can do immediately. Don't have to leave it 24 hours. At least. No, we do it immediately, okay, and thanks. that's because I mean, if I go to the bee yard, I gotta try and get as much as I can done in that one trip. Like I said, we do a 60 mile loop, so even for us just to get to the valley is like 30, 45 minutes. So it's like, okay, what? How much can I do while I'm down here? But on occasion, sometimes we'll oh, I've got queens that need to go out. These girls have already been in here a month. I need to ship out tomorrow, but my cells aren't ready for five days. I'll go ahead and catch early and I'll leave them queenless for you know two, three days before moving them over if, if that's what I need to do. Technically, you can leave a hive queenless for, you know, what, up to 15 days, and then they're going to have possibly reared a new one. Obviously, the longer you go, and depending on the situation, then you might get laying worker or this and that. So, I mean, I try not to make it too long. They're tiny. Like and this is actually, this is, this, I would think, it just recently hatched, so she's probably three days old. I'm going to try and get one that's just a little bit bigger. Is it actually, still alive after up. being exposed to air and all that? This one dried up. Yeah. She's and then you just put put it right in the bottom of there. Yeah, she you dried up, use, so she's not in there. You don't use so royal jelly in that. I don't prime them. If if uh, if I have time, what I will do is I will um, put the cups on the frame, and we'll put this out in the hive, say overnight, oh. so that they can be polished. Oh. But I don't actually prime them. You will find, depending on the species that you're or the the race that you're using of your bees. Uh, Italians are wonderful to graft because they just have copious amounts no, of can jelly. Can you explain again how, how to proceed right. from the beginning? Yeah. Can I explain what? I'm sorry? What you're doing. The whole procedure. Grafting. Yes. Okay. So what I do... <laughs> wait, what was the first question? Oh, I saw two things. So race. I found that Italians have a lot of jelly. I love grafting Italians. However, I love New World carnivores. Me too. So the carnies and the Russians are rather conservative. So they have less jelly. So it's it's sometimes a little bit harder. Like you'll transfer them. It's like, oh, did they get enough jelly? If ever I think they need more jelly between the time that you know we're able to get them back out, which luckily with Mark, like I do the graft, he immediately starts shuttling them back out into the cell building. So we tag team it. But um, sometimes I'll take a little jelly from another larva right next to it. You know to kind of add to it. So what I'm doing is, is I'm looking down in to see what, this, what the age is. You know, queens when they lay, they usually start in the middle, right? And they go around. So by the time you're ready to graft, or when you want to graft, the, the interior bees, like, like this frame here, the middle ones are actually older. The younger ones are towards the outside. So I'm looking over here to find the right size, or the right age larva that I want. I usually, I kind of like to tilt it up. I'm a, I don't want to break this comb. I'm actually really fascinated with war aids, but I kind of feel, and top bars, I first learned on top bars, but I kind of feel like it's only three more pieces of wood, people. Come on, it's just <laughs> only better. <laughs> and it just, it just makes the comb that much more, you know, it gets a little bit more integrity in terms of, at least in terms of manipulation, too. You don't have to worry. So this is actually where they're well placed. I'm going to pass this around so you guys can see that. And I'm going to try and get one that's a little bit bigger, too. But we can't do packages where we're at. I mean, if mesquite flows good, the earliest I could get packages would maybe be early June. Well, guess what? I can make my own noose up north, and my first batches are ready late May. So it's not that not that, you know, different. But package bees, at least the only place I, I learned about them was in Florida. 
and Gary's very it's conscientious bigger, beekeeper. Commercial guy, but very yeah. conscientious. But the whole yeah. package process is rather stressful. And you're taking bees from, you're taking older bees from honey supers. So then they get put in a package with a queen they don't know, and then they get shipped wherever. And those bees basically have to revert. I mean, they have to, because yeah. they've got to pull some comb, they've got to pull wax, you know, they've got to do all these things. things They're at a different phase in their doing. life. Yeah. yeah. So personally, I kind of think packages are a rather stressful um, uh, way to start for the bees, you know? But I know that sometimes that's the only option for people. So I'm going to try and find one now that's just a little too big. Oh, do you use wax foundation? Sometimes we use wax. Okay. This one will pass this around. I can do that. That one is, I can but it's too big. <laughs> right. yeah. So what people have told me is, you know, as I hear other people describe it, they're like, well, once you can see the segments, it's too big. But I'm actually nearsighted, so I can see yeah. near really good, but not well far away. So I can see the segments when they're really small. If you look down in there with your light, you can see the larva closely. Oh, yeah. It's really cool. I mean, they're already moving when they're really small, you know? So it's kind of like, you know, depending on what your vision is. Some people use jeweler's glasses, some people use, you know, yeah, all sorts of things. So you can kind of find what works for you. Now, if grafting is too tedious for you, because I've, I've had a lot of people like, well, I just can't see them. You know, and then they give up, and it's like, well, you can still graft. You know, there's that one method, I don't even know what it's called, where they you make a nick on the bottom and then they'll pull it out. Um, and walk away splitting is one way to do it too. You just make sure to give them young brood or even eggs, right? Because you know that then three days later they'll be ready. And they'll pull them out. You know, so if you can't do it, you can still rear from your own stock or from selected mm -hmm. stock that you like. So don't feel like, I have to learn grafting. I would love it if people do because I really feel that, you know, we're... Small-scale beekeepers are never going to replace commercial guys, but we need more people to pay attention and be intentional, as Deborah Delaney said, be intentional about the stock that you are using. Yes. Could I, um, like if I have a queenless hive, can I just, you know, go rip up a graft and just like put a new queen cups in my hive? It's the perfect time to do it. That's right. Because they're queenless that's, and they need a queen. And that's a great way they to experiment with grafting on a small scale so mm -hmm. you're not making this huge 45 queen commitment. Exactly. You're just and putting three to five maybe? Or yeah. Like and you how can many do would you Bonnie put in? and Gary, they're from Marin. I don't Doesn't know if they stayed for this afternoon 12? session. But they would, they would actually do just, they act, some of their nukes that they made. I love their story because they're just a couple hobbyists in Marin. They learned just like, you know, they had a neighbor, they could see him from their balcony, and they're like, that seems kind of interesting. And the next you know, they got a hive. They got really dis, um, disgruntled with the, with the packages that they were getting out of their own state, okay? So they were like, wow, and, they, and instead of bitching, we better try and just do something. So they actually bought brood from a commercial beekeeper, but then Bonnie, bless her heart, threw out her bee clubs at who's got uh, long-lived bees. She went out, mapped it, went and assessed each one. Um, Mark and I went out there with, uh, they flew us out. We went and helped them assess and picked like the prize breeders out of it. Um, we did a graft off of those. And some of the grafts that we did were in just little four frame nukes and we would just take about five cups, graft into it and stick it in the nuke. Mm -hmm. Then we would come back and we would pull whatever was extra. I only like to put one viable cell in each nuke mm. and I'll tell you why because the first one out is going to go sting out the others. But it takes so much energy. Mm -hmm. Why waste it? Why have them do that? Or, you know, heaven forbid, two of them hatch out and then they fight. Like now whoever is. wins is maimed and she can't go fly. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really, if it's a viable cell and it looks good, just put one. You know, you don't, oh, what do you do? How do you, you don't have to for So once they're grafted, and you can even do a graft and then immediately go put it in a queenless snoop. You don't have to wait for it to cure in a so cell building. I mean, you've got a lot of options, you know. But basically, what I always recommend to people is then when you go to install it, you're going to put it on a brood frame. Don't put it right near the top, okay? Temperature-wise, if it gets too hot, it'll cook. If it gets too cold, the bees are going to cluster down below and she's going to be neglected, okay? So put it right down in the brood. Um, with these base cups, it's nice because you can just push it and it's in. But if you're, you know, if you're nervous about it, you can kind of make a, I don't want to ruin this comb, but you can kind of make a little indentation with your thumb and then stick it, you know, right there. And they'll pull it out and then she'll emerge out, okay? So that, that's what I recommend because, and we have such extreme uh, temperature swings. Usually, you know, once it sort of levels out, um, 
like in May, sometimes, you know, if we're in a rush, we can just stick them between the bars right on top, but that's only if I have shade muddy theory, I do that. <laughs> um, so, because, yeah, there's just a variety of things that, I don't know if I'll stay on the phone. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of that process. I, I'd love for you guys to try grafting if you want. I know I kind of spit out a lot at you, but it's like, gosh, you know, how do we talk about this? Um, I'm trying to think the other key concepts that I want to make sure that you guys get, which is um, first, when you practice, practice, you can even practice on drone brood. Try and go for big stuff, okay, when you're first starting, so that you can just actually learn how to use the tool, how to go in and twist and get them out. Then start going for smaller and try and get the smallest you can get with jelly. Then you can go for speed, okay? Because you do kind of want to be you do kind of want to be swift. I mean, right now, like I said, this is not the ideal time to be grafting. Early spring, we won't start grafting until actually we graft more in the evenings because our morning temps are still so chilly. So we will graft in the evening times. Now with summertime, we actually have to plan around. We get monsoon, so we have to plan around our our rain. You know, so usually we'll set the cell builders up in the morning, then we get a big storm break, and then sometimes late afternoon we can do it. Um, or we'll prep them the day before, and then the next day do it in the morning before it gets too hot. I actually really prefer grafting in inclement weather, especially in our parts, because humidity is, is lacking in our area, so they really can dry out quickly. Additionally, um, if I put the graft in it <laughs> towards the evening, all those foragers are coming home. They're not going to be making the royal jelly, but they're going to be the ones pooling and sweating out the wax. And so if you put your graft in towards the evening, everybody's home just tending to these grafts, and you know they're getting the attention they need right away. Whereas if you put them in at the height of the day, most of them are probably out foraging. I mean, your nurses are still doing their thing, but the temperatures, you know, it's different. They're just, you know, there's not as many bees in the hive. Colonel spotted a bunch of tiny children. Before they kill him One day Rhea conspired to overthrow him Handed Kronos a rock and baby clothing In the forest a nymph, her name Melissa Queen Bee, ba 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 